So I really like doing odd stuff. A lot, a lot of patience. That's number one. I mean, AI is becoming more and more like an everyday thing. It's not special anymore. What's community for you? Bring me something a bit more challenging than the sauces. I think you need some water. I think I think you need some water, Simon. In this episode, I'm talking to Yaron Sagib, CMO of UVI, a company that uses AI and proprietary hardware to automate the inspection process for vehicles. They've raised over $200 million across several rounds of funding and is set to do over nine figures in revenue this year. We're gonna talk about number one, the company's top marketing channels, enterprise sales, field marketing, events, and cold outreach, email and SDRs, and the percentage that each one of these channels contribute to revenue. Number two, his thoughts on paid PR. Is it still worth it to pay money for PR in 2024? And how much can one expect in terms of monthly engagement? How much it costs exactly? And number three, we're gonna try to figure out things like how much money exactly the company makes per year and personal things like Yaron's childhood and his thoughts on unconventional marketing strategies to attract PR attention. And every time he can answer a question, as usual, we both have to take a shot of hot sauce from our sponsor today, Good Looking Hot Sauce. In fact, if you're sitting around and you want a bottle to join in, there's actually a promo code right here. Use this code and you get 15% off your next order. Hope you enjoy this one, Martians. Wish me luck. Hello, hello, Martians. Welcome back to another episode of Marketing on Mars. We are recording episode 97, okay? Um, and we have a, a, a special guest. For me, it's a very special guest because... Yaron uh, actually came onto the show before we even had hot sauce on the show. Um, y Yaron is currently the, the CMO of a company called UVI. And basically, they use computer vision, uh, kind of AI technology to, to scan and inspect vehicles um, using their proprietary hardware. It's a very, very interesting startup. And I believe they've raised over $90 million in investments. Um, so... Yaron, thank you for coming back to round two. Um, great to be here. Great to be here. We raised over 200 million to date and growing. But uh, yeah, besides that, you got it all right. And uh, happy to be here back with the back for the hot sauce, right? You came back for the hot sauce. You didn't of come course. back for me. You came back for the hot no, sauce. Of course. All right, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting. When we first, I believe you were episode 10. You're mm -hmm. pretty early on in in the journey of marketing on Mars, and at that time we didn't have hot sauce, we didn't have sponsors, but now now we do. So, uh, just a quick recap um, for you and for the ones listening that don't know, we start off the show with a shot of hot sauce. So we have hot sauce sent to us by our sponsors, good looking hot sauce. Uh, I believe we have like a, a promo code too. You guys can check it out if you guys want to test out some of the hot sauce, but. We start off with a shot of hot sauce and throughout the show, we're going to talk marketing. I'm going to ask you questions unfiltered. And every time you cannot answer a question, we, we, we level up and we go to the next shot of hot sauce. It gets spicier and spicier as it goes. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So you, which hot sauce do you have for, uh, which ones did you bring today or did they send you? So I got the mango me crazy. This okay. one. I don't have that. Okay, cheeky chipotle here. I don't have that too. What the heck? Oh, let's they see. gave you the good ones. Cayenne, yeah, handle it. Cayenne, yeah, handle it. My favorite. This is my favorite. Yeah. This is my favorite right. one. Okay, okay. So, um, so just look at the look at the bottle. Whichever one has one. Uh -huh. uh, let's let's start with the one. Okay, this is two, three. I only got I got two. They have two. Oh, okay. Just do a two then. So you only got the you only got they only because gave you the spicy good. stuff. So good. All right. I'm not afraid. Yeah. Can you eat pretty spicy? You don't. Uh, I think I can. I hope I can. Okay. Yeah. So I got a spoon here. So we'll start off with a quick shot. Do you have a spoon or a? Yeah, shot I do. Glass? Uh, I mean, yeah. No, no, not a shot glass. A spoon. Okay. So with the. Two. You sound so excited to do this, you don't. Uh, of course, I was dreaming about it. <laughs> Second. Okay, yeah. So, All right. okay. You ready? Yeah, I All guess right. so. Cheers. Cheers. 
Mm. Yeah, good. Delicious. Delicious. That's it? That's it. The show's over. Yeah, okay. that's it. <laughs> yeah, we can just wrap up. Um, no, but it's been a long time since we last spoke. Uh, I believe it's been almost a year. So maybe before we even start with anything, uh, how's the last year been for you? Maybe give us um, one highlight from a business standpoint and one highlight from a personal Standpoint. I mean, it's been p- pretty crazy. Uh, we've been skating in the United States. We're installing over 300 car dealerships. We had a very big um, announcement with Amazon end of the year. So that was really, really exciting. We're installing in uh, all of their Amazon Prime locations. So that's end of last year. Uh, won a couple of big awards. Uh, so good stuff, you know, enjoying it. Wow. And then what about from your personal standpoint? Any any new hobbies that you've picked up or any big life nah. updates? No, I'm a bit of a workaholic and bo- boring person with two kids in the suburbs. I started uh, studying yeah. in a CMO program in Columbia University. So that's fun. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I guess that's a, an exciting update. So, yeah. Okay, cool, cool. So um, did you say Ohio? University? No, no, Columbia University, New York. Oh, Columbia. Okay, mm-hmm. Columbia University, and that's is that close by to where? Because you're you're in t- uh, New Jersey, right? I'm in New Jersey, in, okay. in North Jersey. It's uh, pretty close, and it's virtual. You know, most of it hybrid, so easy. Yeah. <laughs> Sweet. Okay. Cool. Let's get into the actual. So, so, so the um, the show has been designed. So the team that's watching, we have a live team watching right now. Mm-hmm. They, they've given me a list of questions. Their goal is to try to get us to take shots of hot sauce. So okay. we, we got to do our best to answer everything that, that they throw. I don't even know most of these questions. Um, okay. So we're just going to go in. We usually start with some personal stuff just to get to know you as a guest, as a person. Okay. Sure. And then we're going to dive into the marketing stuff, which is the meat of it. So okay. they've, given me, they've given me five questions. We're just going to go through them. Um, uh, Let's do it. Yeah, this this one's interesting because I I know you, you as a growth uh, as a growth hacker. Mm-hmm. You you've worked at many different companies where you've kind of um you know joined joined at early stages and kind of grew it. Uh, UVI, you've been there for four years now, and um, before that, you worked at many other companies as a, as you know growth hacking. As a growth hacker, what would you say? is the most unconventional strategy that you've used maybe in the last 12 to 24 months? Things that maybe most marketers won't even consider. Um, Wow. So I really like uh, doing odd stuff uh, for PR, I would say. Um, I have really weird and wonderful examples, actually more from the consumer startups that that I was at. uh, so I, I can give you a couple of examples. Uh, one of them was when I was at Funzing in London. Uh, we initiated a beer yoga event. It was a marketplace for events. So we brought a bunch of people to a bar in Shoreditch. And we had a yoga instructor uh, have everybody <laughs> hold beer bottles and uh, do yoga uh, <laughs> postures. And that got a lot of uh, PR attention. Another one is that we hired the world's first full-time Pokemon Go hunter. Uh, so we paid someone a full-time job, a monthly salary, to teach people how to play Pokemon Go. Wow. Uh, so uh, that, that kind of stuff, it's a bit unconventional. Yeah, it's a bit harder with the car dealerships and uh, the industry I'm at today, do these kind of things, but uh, still working on it. If you could do anything, uh, and just continue on this one, if you can do anything, like if you had full reign for UVI, and you wouldn't w- worry about you know negative publicity or whatever. W- what kind of cool stunts would you do if it was like, let's say, UVI was your your, your baby? Yeah, I, I'm not worried about any negative publicity. I would just do much more consumer related stuff. So you know, our, our machine scans cars, drives through, takes pictures below, around, tells you anything is wrong with it. I would just I would just do like free scans, you know, at the, the parking lots, at the, you know different places where people go. Uh, kind of just to see their vehicle condition and, and just educate and, and show, you know, that people scan and, uh, and experience it for themselves and ask them what their fir- first scan felt like. That, that's what I would have done. Yeah. What, what if you went to like the busiest street in New York and you just, 
and you just woke up at 3 a.m. with your crew and you just placed a UVI scan and people <laughs> are driving through it and they get free oh, scans all day. Yeah, or, or walking through it, right? Yeah. Just scanning pictures of people. Uh, yeah, I mean, that that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Or, or you know, think of an unconventional place where people turn up with their cars, like uh, tailgating before a game or something. And, uh, you know, just having that at the entrance or something of that sort, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, or one like one of those drive-through movie nights kind of thing, and then you cool. just in the corner. We actually had a, one of the dealers in uh, in Georgia that wanted to uh, uh, try and look for roadkill and animals that are stuck below the vehicle. Oh my! You God. know, yeah. So uh, some people wow. have uh, some really wonderful and, and odd things below their car that they haven't even known about. So yeah, it's insane. Mm-hmm. It's insane. Um, cool. Um, I guess this this next one is uh, I'm I'm curious about this as well. Uh, so we you work a lot, I work a lot. You're a workaholic. I'm also only Monday to Friday. I'm probably a workaholic. Um, but like, what are some hobbies or interests outside of work that keep you grounded? You know, you, you we we need some break sometimes. Like, what kind of hobbies do you have? Yeah. Uh, so first of all, I got two kids. Right, I got a four year old and a 19 months old. So whatever you do, they keep you they keep you busy, right? Uh, so uh, I know I enjoy it. I, I, you know, they're they're great, and uh, that's I, that I guess takes a lot of my time. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I guess that um, sports, uh, you know, uh, swimming, uh, weight training, soccer, uh, watching soccer, uh, though those those kind of things are the main ones i guess kayaking uh yeah if i had kayaking. more time we'll do other crazy things but yeah uh did you watch the the euro cup or the copa America yeah yeah cup? no the the euro cup sure yeah 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 you didn't watch the copa america and uh, no not really no, no yeah who watches the copa america anyways um uh, yeah i guess so <laughs> sorry we have an audience of people from 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 uh, Paraguay, so yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, I apologize. Definitely... Everybody, everybody watches. And apologize. Yeah, everyone cares about. Cobra. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Who okay. cares about the Euro Cup? Um, yeah. yeah sure. Yeah. Um, were you happy with the result? The, the Euro Cup. Result? Uh, well, to be honest, I was uh, rooting for England in the final, and they didn't win. So you know, yeah. at least they got to the final. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Uh, Canada came fourth place, so we're, we're pretty happy. We we came in fourth place with. While scoring two goals, I believe, the whole tournament. So um, Canada in the Euros? I think you're confused. No, 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 in the Copa. Copa. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, but who okay. cares about Copa, anyways? Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Whatever. Uh, anyways, um, okay. So kayaking, swimming, soccer. That's that's those are those are a lot of you know, hobbies. I'm assuming your kids will probably uh, get into those kind of sports. So that's uh, really cool. Yeah. Um, uh, are you pretty involved with the the community? I mean, many people that I talk to that are, you know, C suites or uh, or above are very involved with the community. Uh, how what role does community play in your professional life? That's a great question. I mean, uh, first of all, uh, what what's community for you? Like, uh, is it community of uh, people that have the same uh, uh, job as you? Is it people that are in the automotive industry? Is it people that are, in my case, Israeli entrepreneurs or uh, the Israeli startup scene? Just a few circles around there. Uh, so, I think all, yeah, know, all of that. Yeah. All of that, yeah. So I'm involved in one way or another, you know. If, uh, you know, there's meetup events, there's... Uh, uh, you know, there's still groups from Israel I'm part of. Uh, Living in northern uh, New Jersey, there's quite a quite a big community of people around startups and and people that come or actually commute into the city because uh, we're 25 minutes from New York. So, uh, you know, uh, to be honest, like w- again, between having two two small kids and uh, and a startup, it's a bit uh, hard to uh, invent. Uh, you know, you know, look for things to do all day, but uh, here and there, I'm, I'm, I try and uh, do my piece. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I have uh, one of my friends just recently had. Um, he's also a founder. He just had his first kid uh, after he raised his his seed round. So raised six million dollars for a startup, and then within a year, he got his first kid, and now the kid is fourteen months old. So similar to the, the you yeah. know the age of your ch- smallest one, and. 
he he you know sometimes we we hang out and we're planning out for a tennis outing and then suddenly the kid will start throwing up and uncontrollably food poisoning or whatever because you know kids are very sensitive right so yeah. i totally get it like it's it's challenging to balance everything when you have kids now you have two so yeah yeah but then you do it quickly and you you know they get older and uh, then you're free right so yeah just yeah. putting through you just gotta get through that uh period of time uh, just gotta get through 18 years until they're 18 just gotta you, you got uh, you got you got 14 yeah. years left to go or 17 One would years. say you're almost yeah. there Almost there, exactly. Yeah. Um, you have any personal goals that you're trying to achieve this year? I think that, uh, I mean, what, define personal. Is it work or is it uh, outside of work? Whatever you want, whatever you think, whatever is personal. I to mean, you. A, lot, a lot of my life is around work. So, uh, yeah. you know, we're, we're really scaling. I did a lot of changes, kind of uh, the focus of, uh, of marketing it at UVI of doing much more demand generation, doing things that maybe in the past we did less. So, uh, you know, uh, they build that whole side now. So that's really exciting. Uh, and we got a couple of really big, uh, big partnerships coming up. So mm-hmm. a lot around that. And, uh, you know, personally, uh, let's uh, let's all wish for peace in the Middle East, you know, I'll compromise for that. Peace in the Middle East. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's super important. Um, man, this next question is going to be a challenging one. I don't know how you're going to answer this one, but, uh, the the team put it together. So you have a lot of partners and a lot of investors as well, uh, as well. Um, some of your investors are actually your partners as well. Who's your least favorite partner that you've worked with? (laughs) What like that works with us or like define a partner? Um, I don't know, like, like, like with the Amazon partnership, you know, that, that's a potential, yeah. that's a partner. And I know you've also partnered up with like other, um, you know, you, you like Toyota, Volvo, all these, uh, or like Berkeley, uh, FIT ventures, you know, all these other partners, CarMax, yeah. who, uh-huh. who has been the most challenging and most difficult partner that you've worked with. So, you know, I, 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 I mean, well, do you expect me to be politically correct? Or I see hot sauce. So, so I just take a hot sauce now because I can't trash anyone. Okay. <laughs> Let's do that. Yeah. I like that. I like, yeah. You could, okay. yeah, yeah. The team is getting way too excited back there. But, uh, okay. Oh my God. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm leveling up now. I'm going to number two. I'm two already chilies. number two. So you're, oh, yeah. all right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I poured a little too much, but we'll see how it goes. All right. Cheers. Behind. Cheers. Is that cayenne to handle it? Yeah. Wasn't so bad. Yeah. It's a little sour. A little bit. Good. It's good. No, it's actually good. Yeah. It's my drink of choice. Yeah. We should do hot sauce and yoga. You know? Just chugging you know bottles of hot sauce. Yeah, that, 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 would, that would work. That would work. That I mean, work. not work for the people, but would get attention for sure. Yeah. Um, cool. I think you need some water. I think, I think you I need, need some water. Some, I think I need a little bit of water. Yeah, I didn't eat yeah. a lot of food earlier. Okay. Which hurts. Um, okay, let, let's, switch, let's switch gears. Let's talk about UVI a little bit. So yeah. I've, kind, I've kind of given a little bit of an intro to UVI, but... Maybe you can give us an intro again and tell us uh, what exactly UVI does and the business model. So at UVI, we create uh, automatic inspection devices for cars, a little bit like MRIs. And uh, we actually lease these kind of stations for mainly car dealers, car manufacturers, rental companies, uh, fleets, auctions. So anyone that would want to check a car, okay? And at the end of the day, if you're a customer that owns a car, like most of us, you just drive your car through it, and within a few seconds, we'll diagnose anything that's wrong with your car. We lower around tires, anything like that. And the business model is a monthly subscription that a customer would pay in order to be able to offer the service. Mm. And when you mean customers, you mean the um, like the car dealerships or or like Volvo or whatever that that has the UVI installed, right? Yeah. So the car dealership can put it at the service lane and drive a car through i mean it's customers put it to the service there and anyone who comes through would 
we drive through it and to diagnose anything that's wrong with it. Yeah. How accurate is this? Um, and I ask because, you know, AI is still an emerging technology. I know it's, it's pretty accurate. It's very fast. I think speed is where AI really wins. How accurate is it? Would you say? So what we released is over 95%. So we really try and, and make sure that any kind of uh, tire issue, you know, uh, I don't know, damage on the side of the tire or uh, uh, if the tires are worn out or leaks or anything like that, it's smart that it's over 95%. Wow. What about the, the remaining 5%? Like what types of things does it typically miss? Like, for example, nails that are stuck in the wheel, maybe it misses those. Like are there, are there like common things that are missed? So first, it's it's not about a common thing. The algorithm, it's uh, it's not perfect, you know. It's, yeah. uh, at the end of the day, uh, we don't claim to be perfect. So sometimes it would mark something as an issue, a scratch or a dent or something, and it's a false positive because of the light angle, because of uh, the yeah. color, because of dirt. It could happen. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, any kind of issue. And you mentioned nails, so we scan like a third of the tire. So if there's a nail there, we'd catch it. If not, it, we won't see it. So, yeah. I mean, to be fair to you, I mean, even humans, there are like, when you go to a mechanic, humans will have often have errors. Like we never, you know, there's probably a even larger margin of error with humans. Right? Much so, larger. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We, we actually saw that when we check cars, we find 96% of uh, issues that manually later on people would see or, you know, verify versus 25% on a kind of a benchmark. Of, yeah. Yeah. Wow. 25%. And what, and how, how is the cost? Is, is it very cost prohibitive right now because it's still new technology, nascent technology? Or, you know, if I were drive, if I'm in New Jersey and I'm, I have a choice between a human mechanic to check my car or UVI, what's the difference in price? Doesn't cost you the customer anything. It costs the dealership, uh, if it's in, in this example, it costs them a monthly subscription. It very, varies between six thousand to seven thousand dollars a month in the U.S. Um, so it's we go on these kind of subscription lease contracts. So it's pretty affordable, and uh, for you as a customer, it doesn't cost anything. Just get out of your car, and it's ready for you in a screen. That's crazy. Uh, and I remember last time you guys didn't really expand into Canada yet. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you guys in Canada already? No, but uh, there's things that are that are cooking. Hopefully, next next episode when you bring me something uh, okay. a bit more challenging than these sauces, maybe. Oh, you know, yeah, may, well, you maybe. Hear, you hear that? Good looking. You hear that? Good looking. You gotta get some. You gotta add like an extra star. You gotta add a fifth, fifth pepper on that. A fifth pepper. Okay. I, well, yeah. I don't have. I have three. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you have a? Do you have one that has four? Like this one? No. No. Oh man. Okay, I have a four, so I'll go up to four after this one. But um, okay. but uh, cool. So you guys are expanding. You guys just signed a big partnership um, with Amazon. Um, what are your uh, you know here in twenty twenty four? I know it might have changed from twenty twenty three, but what are your top marketing channels today in twenty twenty four and maybe leading up to twenty twenty five? What what are the the major channels for you to get more customers right now? So uh, a channel for us would be working through the car manufacturers. So once we work with uh, Volvo or General Motors or others, they kind of uh, help us get into their dealer network. And some of them give incentives for the dealers to join UVI as well. Um, so that's definitely a big partnership channel that we have. There's the National Dealer Association event or uh, kind of organization. They have a yearly event in January which is the biggest kind of uh, automotive technology, te uh, you know, automotive tech event in the, or dealer event in the United States. That's a really, really big channel for us. Just that event and things around it. Uh, there's different dealer associations of states. There's, uh, you know, obviously more traditional kind of marketing around uh, cold emails, SDR, uh, you know, uh, uh, those kind of things, buying lists, uh, door to door. So it, it varies really. Yeah. Well, what do you think, um, at least in the last 12 months, where has, what percentage of your deal flow came through dealer networks, like the car manufacturers, what percent came from big events and what percent came from cold emails at cold outreach, would you say? So I would say like 40, 40, 20, 40, 40, 20. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
40, yeah. 40, 20. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. Um, and do, do you expect that to be the same in 2025 or is there going to be a bigger focus towards events? Cause you've already exhausted most of the car manufacturers. Uh, we didn't exhaust, if anything, the car manufacturer is going to go up because we're working oh. with new ones and more. Yeah. Interesting. So, yeah, but that's a pretty healthy ratio, I guess. 40, 40, 20. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Cause you don't, you don't want to be relying 80% on cold. That means that you're not building good relationships with your <laughs> manufacturers. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I guess there's more trust involved when you come from a, a source like a manufacturer Absolutely. That, that helps handshake you to the retailers. Right. Yeah. Um, for people listening that are be like, oh man, like I have a similar product where I, I, I would love to sell directly to the manufacturers. What kind of tips would you give them on how you can break into, especially you're, you're talking big companies, Volvo, mm-hmm. uh, Hyundai, like what, what tips would you give them uh, if they're like the marketing leaders? Like how, how can you build out a strong, um, you know, mm-hmm. uh, 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 flow like, to, to uh, tap into yeah. this network? A lot, a lot of patience. That's number one. And, uh, you know, it's like any B2B marketing, especially with the really big ones. You just got to find the, the right uh, department, innovation kind of uh, led uh, uh, person or, you know, office that deals with, with kind of the new technologies and just get through there and just be patient and assertive about it. Uh, and then specifically on in every industry. But, you know, if you want to work with the car manufacturers in the United States or even the Japanese or European or Asian, any of them that, that are in the U.S., so you've got to be in the U.S. If you are in, a, you want to work with the German ones, you want to be in Germany. Like physically, you got to be there a lot. So it's a bit presumptuous to do it from remote. If uh, if you live in Canada, even, and you say, "Okay, I'm going to work with Toyota in Japan," it's going to be very yeah. hard, you know. So are you traveling? Because then, because some of your partners are like, uh, you know, Toyota, for example. Does that mean you're you are actually spending time in Japan, or your team is in Japan? So we, we do have uh, small kind of representations in Germany and Japan, uh, but we're very U.S. or very North America focused now. So we're many here. And probably most of your most of these big companies probably have U.S. headquarters too, right? So you can talk directly mm-hmm. with them. True. Yeah. 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 Cool. Okay. So a lot of patients find the right department. Um, uh-huh. How long? How long was your shortest sales cycle? Uh, and how long was your largest sales cycle breaking into these car manufacturers? So it's a question if it's a manufacturer or a dealer, right? We have different use cases. If it's a car dealership, uh, I mean, it could be really, really quick if they see everything in the, uh, 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 one second, no, okay. If, if they see you in enough places and, you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, see a physical system in our case, because we have a hardware component, uh, they hear a case study. It could be an event that we can close a deal within an hour. Uh, uh, but the sales cycle can also take, uh, I don't know, 150 days. You know, they, they could hear about you and then uh, have a demo. And then three months later, see you at an event. So it really varies. So that's that's for the car manufacturer side, which is that that's like 40% of your of your deal flow. The, the second largest or tied is is uh, our big events. Um, do you have do you do you, do you have like a regimen that you go through? You know, before a big event, like you know, a big event is happening in January. Walk us through your 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 strategy. Like three months out, I'll do this. Four months out, I'll do this. Like, how do you usually? It, it, it depends on the size size of the event. Yeah, obviously, there's the content logistical side of saying I'm at a conference, right? I have a booth. Okay, how big is your booth? How many people do you need there? You have your best practice per type of event of which booth you're going to do, right? If, if it's a, just a smaller technology event for us, just to be around AI, computer vision, we might be good with a 10 by 10 or 10 by 20 and touch screens showing what we do with videos. But when we go to a car industry event or one of the manufacturer events, um, we used to we, we like to usually bring a full system full mm-hmm. kind of, you know, uh, um, full show with, with, with the car inside and so on. So that that takes a few months of, you know, placing it, uh, thinking of the design of, around it. Uh, it's usually standard, but that, that takes three or four months to say, okay, this is a placement. We're going to ship it. This is what we're going to do. If it's, uh, you know, events that are 
attracting a lot of dealers, uh, whether manufacturer level or this National Dealer Association event. We'd like uh, mm. to bring some dealers with us. Last year, we actually flew some dealers to be at our booth and wow. tell others how they're using it. So you got to you know plan that in advance and let people know and, and make content accordingly that would run on the screens of their store, of their kind of case study. So yeah, three, four months is, is you know, there's an ADA is an event we plan even six, five, six, seven months ahead. Oh my so right goodness. now we're planning for January. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's, that's the largest one in the US, right? So, mm -hmm. and you guys are boothing there? You guys are going to have a booth there yeah, as well? Yeah. 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 Every year. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. In my world, in the, in the world of tech, like I go to events. I don't know if you go to most of these events, but I'll go to events like Collision or Saster, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the events are very different. Like when I go out there, again, like you said, it depends what kind of people you're trying to meet as well. Um, in my case, I'm trying to meet other founders. Um, I have a, you know, uh, ex-founder, current founder as well. So I want to meet with other founders. And when I go to these big events, I find, at least I'm not sure, would love to hear your thoughts. Um, not many people, especially when you get to the founder seat, the executive seat, not many people actually go to the actual event, but they go to the side events. You uh -huh. know, they go to the small happy hours where they only connect with other founders and executives yeah. connect with other executives because they don't want to be on the floor being sold to by salespeople. What do you find, like, especially the people that you're trying to meet are, I assume, are more higher up, right, making mm -hmm. decisions. Do yeah. you find that being at the floor helps the most to close a deal or the happy hours is where you close the deals or you need both because you need the, you need the salespeople to be talking about, oh, my God, I saw UVI's booth and it was amazing. You kind of need buy-in from everybody from different levels. Like, what do you find? I mean, yeah, it's all, it's always a mix. In our case, because it's a bit more traditional industry, plus we have a solution which is very much touch it, feel it. Uh, you know, uh, at the floor, at the stage, it's, you know. Got to be there. You got to be there. And the events around, the, the, the dinners, uh, you know, happy hours, uh you know, you got to limit yourself, right? Because uh, if not, uh, you don't wake up in the morning the next day. So uh, get a lot of people in these events. Suddenly Vegas is full of uh, 50 different shows. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, that's uh, obviously sometimes you got to do it for sure. Yeah. Do you guys typically just attend other people's happy hours or do you guys try to throw some on your own as well? <laughs> a bit of both. A bit of both. Bit of both. We did do in the past some, some happy hours for, you know, uh, with uh, General Motors or other companies we work with, and uh, you know, but then sometimes we get invited or take part or sponsor others as well. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, we're taking a quick little um, break from talking about. We'll, we'll get back to marketing because um, um, we do want to talk about some trends that are happening in the AI and the marketing space and hear your thoughts on it. But quick little break. The, the, the team prepared five questions uh, for you and they want you to answer in rapid fire. So, you know, okay. you know, ask your question. You got to answer, you know, quick and in a couple of couple of words. Um, Didn't we have two already? Sorry? There's five more. Didn't we have two already? Yeah. So, so these are, these are going to be like short, very short okay. ones, very short questions, very short answers. So got it. Ready? This okay. is the rapid fire segment. Okay. Cool. Na name one thing that you can't live without. Coffee. Favorite travel destination. Singapore. Ooh. Favorite way to relax. Wind down. Read, a, read a book at an all-inclusive resort. Ooh. A podcast you recently tuned into. Well, I don't want to say something. It's in Hebrew, so you won't know it, but it's about startups in Israel. Okay. I mean, you can say it. I might know it. And it it's a, about startups. In it. You won't know it, it it's, <laughs> but it's okay. Okay. Um, you got to say one. Uh, your favorite customer or... <laughs> Whoa. Didn't get us. Didn't get us. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to have to take a, sh a shot of hot sauce for this because the team thought that they were going to get you on that one. Okay. Um, so I'm going to take a shot of this gin, gin and juice. They, I don't think they sent you this one, right? 
No, no. You better send me afterwards. Yeah. 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 Um, do you want to try that third one? Uh, have you opened the third one? Uh, no, I didn't. But so, I, I won. So do I still need to do this? If you want to try it with me. Okay. okay. I'll be a good sport. We'll do that. It's a mango, mango me crazy. Oh, nice. Nice. Wow. So, so what are you doing with uh, versus because um, they joined in on your Series B, right? Yeah, I mean, there's a difference between an investor relationship and uh, ongoing work. So to date is more uh, from the Japanese side, and we did some stuff there. And, uh, you know, we work a lot with them in the United States with their dealer network and other projects. So and they're close more to us. More involved. Yeah. yeah, very involved, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, cheers. Cheers. Cheers, yeah. Oh, man. It's weird. I'm not used to just taking straight gin, ginger. This is a weird, uh, it's a weird thing. Whoever came up with this show, yeah. Ugh. Um, I thought you, I thought you'd be used for, to it by now. No, no. We have so many different types. We we have um, so many different types of hot sauce right now okay. in my rack. Um, it's it's yeah. It's kind of whenever people come come over to my place, that's the first thing they go, gravitate towards is. I have like a whole wall of fifty. Yeah, I almost died last episode. We should we should have sent your team. We should have sent Yaron. Maybe for the next one, we'll send Yaron some. Now that we know that he can handle spicy, let's send him the what whatever we had yesterday. That was yeah. You think you think I'm doing well till now? That was but yeah, you're doing. Yesterday was not. <laughs> yesterday was really bad. Um, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, anyways, what, what what happened? What happened yesterday? So we had a we had a. Um, um, it, we had the CCO, uh, Chief Creative Officer of ClickUp, and we uh, we did this one that was like habanero mixed with something spicier, and so it was like this. All the stuff that we're having right now is cayenne, I think, mostly mm-hmm. cayenne peppers and um, not that spicy. But yeah, next time we'll we'll send you something spicier. All right, up yeah. for the challenge. Nice. Um, where were we? Okay, let's go back to marketing. So AI obviously is transforming the industry. Mm-hmm. ChatGPT. Now there's ChatGPT five. Like it was three, and then four, and then five. What are your thoughts on AI um, in terms of like marketing? AI when it relates to marketing. I mean, AI uh, is becoming more and more like uh, an everyday thing. It's not special anymore, right? Yeah. So when you look at it, there's two two ways to look at it. One is in terms of how you position, segment, uh, I don't know, target, work with telling a story about something that's related to AI, which is becoming more and more simple. Because, you know, if I told you computer vision five, six years ago, you would have, I don't know, 5% of the population would understand what I'm talking about. And now it's, yeah, you know, like algorithm, okay, machine, computer vision image analysis like everybody knows what that is and there's so many applications so i think uh, marketing ai stories is easier i mean and uh, also it's uh, the more diversity there is if you actually have something positive to tell around ai it's even uh you know it's even better to to market uh so because there's so much uh so much uh scared the uh, stories around the terminators taking around uh, over the world so all in all if you have an ai tech or ai story you want to tell i think it's easier more simple more digested and then from the other side you know so there are a lot of ways to use ai in marketing i don't think it's as uh, as uh, deep as people thought that chat gpt is going to replace all the content writers in the world but yeah. uh it's definitely cool things you can do with it yeah, uh, a stat that I read recently, um, and people might not even know this, but 88% of marketers were already using AI in, in 2021. This was before ChatGPT even came up. There was already AI being used in so many of our you know, platforms and everything. Um, and, and now it's closer to 90, not like over 90%, 92%. Um, not not sure why the team is laughing at, at these stats. These are very serious stats, guys. Serious stats. Uh, these are very serious. Um, but uh, but yeah, like I I totally I totally agree. Like it's 
kind of it's already been uh, in, in our uh, ecosystem. Um, do you think PR is still worth money? Is it still worth paying for a PR nowadays? PR agency? Yeah, just PR in general. Yeah. Like, is it still worth paying for attention nowadays? Like, is it even worth the money now or is organic just investing in or- and trying to get organic the way to go? It's always, it's always worth paying. It's just worth paying in the right places. Most people don't pay it in the right places. Right. So it's very easy to think that uh, you have magicians and a PR agency will invent stories and put you in the Wall Street Journal in a day. But that doesn't happen. Uh, but you got to you got to pay in order to to build something that is of value or sometimes you, you pay advertorial as well. And in, in, our, in my case, we do use an agency. Uh, shout out to Headline Media. They're actually uh, really good. Uh, so, you know, uh, also. Uh, I've many times worked without an agency, so it's it's not something that I would say is uh, mandatory. Uh, so is it worth paying for? I think you gotta you gotta put some budget in it, but just do it smart and not just think people are gonna solve and create stories for you. And uh, you know, they'll just uh, spend mon- your time and money on uh, strategy meetings and uh, high level stuff and uh, put you in Yahoo Finance through PR Newswire. So yeah, you know. What, what what would you um like like you mentioned uh, it's all about the placement like where do you find the best ROI nowadays for for PR for PR uh, well I'll tell you something really cool that we're seeing uh, that's kind of the local angle so we have over three hundred car dealerships using uh, UVI and a lot of it is in uh, in different states right so when we pitch and talk to morning shows, okay, and news shows, so, so CBS, Detroit, ABC, all of those kind of local stations, say, hey, look, this dealer is using like, you know, like an MRI for cars. He's one of the only ones doing it. Go we'll speak to people and see what they think about it. That 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 works really well. You know, if you, if you look at our YouTube or you, you'll see a ton of those recently. Nice. Okay. And what, what's, what's the going rate nowadays for like a PR? Because I know you, you go through an agency, but there's like mm-hmm. a huge range. There's a range, right? Like what's what do you think is a range of a PR cost now nowadays? Uh, it really varies. You can get a small firm or a freelancer that does this for three or four k a month, and you can go up to companies that pay twenty five k a month, right? Uh, I think the sweet spot is probably in the middle. Depends on your size. If you're a small company and you want to be nimble, you could do it by yourself as well. Just pay for a news wire when you want to amplify something and. You know, work uh, through LinkedIn, through being assertive, uh, become friendly with journalists directly. And if you know how to find things that interest them in the right way, you can get it yourself, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> recently talked to a founder um, working on um, basically turning your LinkedIn into like organic and PR, uh, mm-hmm. a, a PR engine. Uh, as you see, like, a, a, like LinkedIn can be very powerful. I know some CEOs that are paying Twenty thousand dollars for a firm to manage your LinkedIn thoughts on LinkedIn as a as a thought leadership angle to to get more uh, eyeballs. Yeah, LinkedIn's great. It's probably the only channel today, right? I don't know if I would have paid a company twenty grand to to operate anything there, and I uh, you know definitely wouldn't rely on ChatGPT for anything like that. But if you're uh, you know. Uh, it's it's just uh, putting time into it. I think you know think thinking that every. Every every uh, post counts, and uh, using articles and LinkedIn is great. Uh, and uh, and yeah, it's it's not so difficult. It's just uh, a matter of attention to it. So obviously, yes, in most industries, B two B, even B two C, in some way, uh, if you want to go B two B to C, the right people are on LinkedIn. So most industries, from the more traditional ones, just like automotive, just a lot of folks that are work, working in a car dealership and are on LinkedIn. Uh, other social networks, you know what? Well, where I've seen actually really nice, uh, I don't know if ROI, but like good, good kind of traction is actually TikTok. Oh, yeah. TikTok. Yeah, surprisingly. F- for certain industries or for your industry? Or? For my industry. I mean, if you, really? if you look and, and see, there's some really uh, viral uh, people channel, you know, channels and, and types of content. Uh, which visually really resonate well with what we're doing. 
because it's, it's a really visual tool, right? You drive your car, there's lights all over you, flashing, you get out, you see a big screen, you know? So our, our, our device, our technology looks really cool in these kind of short videos. Mm. So we've done some stuff that worked really well. Yeah, I can totally see that stuff, kind of stuff going viral. Like, a, I don't know, like a UVI challenge, uh, and people posting about them going through uh, like a UVI device, kind of like how people post, you know, how people post about them going through car washes and then like the mm -hmm. foam covers their car and it's such a cool experience. So like I can yeah. see that kind of stuff going viral. So that's, uh, yeah, that's awesome. Um, what has been the, because you've been to so many events and you mentioned events being a huge, a huge kind of driver for your, for business and everything. What has been some of the worst events that you've been to? Have you been to a bad event in the last 12 months? Not, not in the last 12 months. Uh, I mean, we're very picky with the events that we go to. Obviously, I've been in uh, in events as where, you know, uh, I remember a couple of ones in Europe around AI, which are useless. Uh, um, maybe early on, early days when we went to car shows, you know, more from the consumer retail kind of side of like people who are car enthusiasts that want to go there. You know, you go put a table and say, yeah, we do this technology. It's like, where's the bridge? Because we're not, we weren't at the scale to touch, you know, and, exactly. and have every person go through through a scan. So it wasn't yeah. really a consumer play. Uh, so, you know, we've done that, but, but we're pretty picky. We don't go to, to a lot of shows, to be honest. Mm. So that was, that was more so on your guys' side. You guys chose the wrong show. But, uh, but was there a show that you went to where you chose to? Let's say in the last 24 months, like you chose to go there and it was the right show, but the, the organizers and everything and the way it was, like the agenda and everything was just not good. I, I think you're dying for me to trash someone, but no, I can't think of anyone that I can trash. Every That's event amazing. is amazing. Every event is amazing because you don't go to a lot of events and you pick the ones that uh, you spend more on less events rather than less on many events. And then uh, you go to good ones, right? And uh, and that's it. And you're a bit uh, stingy with what you go to. And, and usually you don't make a mistake like that. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. And very good answer. You're, you're choosing not to create enemies, which is the way, which is not our thesis, not our uh, philosophy on the show, as you can imagine. <laughs> um, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So we got, we got like, Eight minutes left. We usually spend the last uh, eight minutes of the show just diving into your background, um, okay. not your professional background, but your personal background. Like, sure. what life was like for you growing up? What was like little baby Yaron? Like, mm -hmm. you know, like where were you? Like, just tell us a little bit about your life. Like, were you raised by? Were you raised in a pretty wealthy family, middle class, lower class, and like, what was this life like as a kid? Uh... Yeah, I actually had a bit of an odd uh, kind of, uh, I would say, childhood because, you know, I was born in Singapore. I have a, I have a twin brother, an elder brother, so that's, uh, having a twin is also an experience of its own, uh, identical twin brother. I uh, grew up in Singapore until I was uh, three or four years old, went back to Israel, which is where my family is from, lived in Israel for a few more years, seven until 12 uh Due to my dad's uh, job, we moved to South Africa, to Pretoria. So I lived in South Africa for all my primary school. Then came back to Israel when I was uh, 12 years old. Uh, then, uh, you know, lived in Israel, was an officer in the military. Uh, it's compulsory service in Israel, and I did a bit more. Uh, did a big trip in Asia after, taught English in Vietnam, uh, traveled oh, around there, smokes. went back to Israel, went studied my my bachelor's degree, co-founded two startups, moved to to London was the second one, uh, lived in the UK for four years. My wife is English, moved back to Israel for UVI in 2018, uh, uh, you know, and then moved to the States in uh, the end of 2021. So that's uh, in a nutshell, that's my uh, life journey. Wow. That's incredible. So you've, you've traveled so much, even... Even before you were twelve, you've already been to like three, three uh, continents, mm -hmm. right? Or that's that's incredible. Um, so much to dive into. Which which you know, Singapore, Israel, Africa? Which of these places do you think shaped you the most? 
and who you are today? Or London, uh, or was it London that shaped you the most? No, definitely Israel. I'm very Israeli in many senses. Um, you know, South Africa was a shaping age. You're a kid, seven till 12. That's all your elementary school. So that for the time, for five years, it was also a very, uh, uh, very strong uh, kind of uh, impression. Singapore was a baby, so it's not like I remember anything too much. And, uh, you know, London is where I got my wife. So that's significant enough as well. Uh, but no, definitely Israel. I'm, I'm 100% Israeli. It's no question. What What about it? What about raising in, being raised in Israel shaped you? Like, was it, was it uh, you know, the culture? Was it um, your, your family, uh, your parents and what they were, you know, what they were teaching you um, mm-hmm. as a kid? Like, which part of is- Israel shaped you the most? I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, out of any minority in the world or a small country like Israel, you probably have the most percentage of Israelis on this show compared to a lot of other countries. Am I correct or, or right or wrong? Like, on, just a on, lot of entrepreneurs out of Israel, right? Oh, yeah. You mean on Marketing on Mars? On Marketing on Mars or any kind of these shows, you know, you, you'd see quite a bunch of Israeli founders, oh. right? Yeah, we definitely had one mm-hmm. uh, from a company called Sky. Okay. Sky.ai, S K A I. She's okay. Yeah. She's from Israel and she actually shot it uh, in Israel and we saw the uh-huh. background and everything. But aside yeah. from you two, I maybe like mm-hmm. one other one? No, like not not so many, I don't think. Okay. I don't know. So uh I think that uh like Israel's very unique in terms of uh of the startup culture and uh you know there's a lot of reasons to it. There's a great book called The Startup Nation, which I highly recommend to read. Um, that talks about it, but there's a few characteristics that just make it a very small country with a lot of uh, very outspoken and uh, very assertive people that, uh, you know, uh, from a young age are exposed to a lot of technology. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I think that, that, that that's why you see a lot of, a lot of Israelis uh, relative to the amount of population, it's a small country, but actually go out to the States, go out abroad, you know, uh, Waze is Israeli, right? Uh, um, you know, the technology of WhatsApp started out of, there's a lot of companies that you don't even know that are from Israel. Uh, wow. So, uh, yeah, so there's uh, there's something in the DNA, something in the culture for sure. Do you go, um, so, wow, so many things. Uh, first of all, do you go back often to Israel? Uh, I do. I try. I mean, obviously now it's a bit of a tricky situation, but, uh, you know, I, I, I try to go, uh, uh, three, four times a year to visit for sure. Yeah. Wow. Um, what, 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 what did your parents, uh, what did your parents do? And, uh, when you were growing up as a kid, did you learn a lot of your entrepreneurial spirit from your parents? Uh, or did you learn it from other mentors, uncles or whatever, or mm-hmm. how did you become uh, so entrepreneurial? It was pretty natural. I mean, my dad's an engineer, so very, like, obviously exposes you to a lot of technology, um, but obviously more traditional. Um, so I think that, you know, as a kid, I, I liked computers. I ended up when I was in high school or even middle school uh, working in summer camps, teaching coding and design and things like that. And then uh, when I was in university, I just had a, I studied my, uh, my bachelor's. I had a great idea and just raised money for it. So, uh, you know, it just happened. Like, uh, it, it, I don't know. It just, uh, I told you I was in the military before and there usually you get a lot of responsibility at a very young age. And then, uh, you know, then when I got out, I just had a good idea and it was easy and accessible to, to go to investors and raise money. So happened. Uh, and you taught English in Vietnam. I mean, honestly, we yeah, can we can have a whole hour conversation just about your background because I I've been to I've been to Singapore. I've been to Vietnam as well. I love Vietnam. I was just there yeah. uh, in November. I'm pretty sure we can have a whole hour long conversation just about that. But uh, I know we're up on time. Um, this was this was cool. This was a little different. I'm sure from the first show without the hot sauce. What do you what do you feel? How do you feel about the hot sauce? I expected more. Like I was, uh, I was scared. It uh, it wasn't that bad. It's good. Yeah, yeah. I'm well, gonna have it for for fun now. You know. That's yeah, it. just 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 take it, just take it for fun with your friends. 
Did you like yeah. that one? Can you handle it? Uh, I think it's one of my favorites here. This is a promo. This was my favorite. We got a winner. We got That's a it. winner. Yeah. Well, Yaron, thank you. Yaron, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, definitely have to catch up at some point and hear more about what's going on. Maybe round three uh, back on the pod. But before we wrap up, anything that you'd like to just plug in about UBI or something that you're working on personally or how people can follow along your journey? Um, I mean, I, I hope that uh, there's a few things that are happening soon that uh, once this is aired and a bit after, I hope that uh, many more people in uh, random everyday situations will see a, a nice elegant tunnel and wonder what it is and scan their cars through it. So we, we were definitely uh, uh, before a very big moment uh, that a lot of people that are listening and uh, throughout North America are going to going to be exposed to this kind of technology and uh, it just makes sense. So I hope that, uh, you know, I, I really hope people uh, appreciate it because it is a very positive application of AI. Um, and that's it. I mean, you guys can follow me, you can follow us on, on socials and everywhere. And, uh, yeah. and that's it. Yeah, all the social will be at the bottom. One last hot sauce question. Um, yeah. we, don't, we don't have to take the hot sauce. Que- we don't <laughs> have to take any hot sauce because we're wrapping up. But uh-huh. the last time we were chatting, you guys were having around $60 million in revenue or something like that. Mm-hmm. Where, where are you guys at now? Is it it's, uh, uh, co- according to foreign sources, uh, much more. But uh, that's not uh, not something we publicize. So it's it's foreign definitely we're, we're growing. We're we're definitely double, doubling in more year over year for sure. Ooh, so double of sixty mil, according to my math, is around one hundred and twenty mil, or or even more. No, no, so, no. Uh, that, that, I didn't say anything. About you that. didn't say anything. We didn't say anything. No, no. We didn't, we didn't say, say anything. anything. Didn't say. Uh, well, thank you, Yaron, for joining, and we'll catch you next time. Thank you, guys. All right. Cheers. Cheers.